Coming up on this edition of the Penn State Blitz on Penn Live, we gotta we gotta talk about whether or not James Franklin ran up the score in the opener. We're gonna talk about some true freshman debuts and how much they're gonna play moving forward. Penn State quarterback Sean Clifford was a little antsy at the start of the game. Is he gonna calm down in the second game? And as always, we're gonna get to the Penn State mailbag. <laughs> Okay, Greg, the final score was 79 to 7. Mm -hmm. Idaho, out of Moscow, Idaho, really never had much of a chance. The no. fact that the spread was over 40 points and climbing every week, mm -hmm. um, it was pretty clear right away that they were just going to be too slow and they, were, they just didn't have the depth. Right. Um, but James Franklin kind of went out of his way during Tuesday's news conference mm -hmm. to talk about whether or not uh, – he was trying to run. He was trying to run up the score. Now, obviously, right. he's going to say no. The question is, as you saw the fourth quarter play out, Penn State's on their fifth tailback. Right. They have Michael Schuster, the the uh, non scholarship quarterback in the game. Yep. They've substituted liberal, liberally. Sean Clifford was gone, I think, after the first series of the third quarter. They did score late, but in your mind, did he need to defend himself about running up the score? You know, it, I I didn't really catch the social media flack until. He felt the need to talk about it on Tuesday. That made me go look for it. And yeah. there were some people that were suggesting that they were going to score up and that they shouldn't have went for it on that fourth down and goal to go mm -hmm. late uh, in the second half. I mean, I, I look at it like this. Number one, what are you going to do um, with the Nick Yoris and the Michael Schuster yeah. of the world? These guys don't see the field ever. And they had the opportunity to get out there. And it's not like they were throwing it 80 yards down the field. They sure. were running it up the middle and Idaho couldn't stop them. And it was, you know, pretty darn close to is the scout team, basically, for Penn State was on the field. What are you going to do? I mean, it's not Penn State's fault that Idaho couldn't figure out a way to even yeah. um, remotely come close to mounting a stop. And I think you can't waste the situations that present themselves as it relates to that fourth down deal. So, you know, it, this is not the first time James Franklin's caught heat for this. Yeah. I believe it was... Uh, Georgia State game where he called the timeout to sure. maybe ice the kicker, maybe not ice the kicker. I re went back and read that transcript when he explained that <laughs> the guys on the field had no clue how to be in field yep. goal blocks, so they brought the second team deep. You know, it, this isn't the first time it's come up, but I just don't know what more you can do. It's and unless they yeah. would have agreed at halftime to set a running clock, that's really the only solution I can think of. You know, he's in his sixth year, and once they started to get good in 2016. Mm -hmm. Um, they really weren't really in a position to run up the score the first two years, but they started to get good in 2016. I think there were a couple games that stood out to me where maybe he was just trying to send a message. Uh, when they beat Michigan State to go to the Big Ten right. title game, mm -hmm. the year before, Michigan State had run it up on them. They ran that like the center, center touchdown, whatever that <laughs> was. They, he, they were throwing on them late in the game, and right. I thought that was payback. I thought – uh, last year in the Pittsburgh game when mm -hmm. they were throwing bombs and challenging, I think, spots <laughs> yeah. when they were up 51 to six. Mm -hmm. I think that you if you wanted to give him a little heat over those two, he probably would have a hard time defending himself. I agree. I don't think he was running up the score. I thought he he probably explained it pretty well when he said, you know what? Well, there's, it's so rare when the fourth and fifth team guys get in the game. Right. Is it really fair to put them in the game and ask them not to play hard? Right. Um, it wasn't. They didn't really do anything fancy. Uh, he talked about the fact that Nick Yuri had a great run there. I think to get in the end zone or get I, close. Yeah. And he said it's something he'll he'll take with him for the rest right. of his life. So I think I would. I'm probably on James Franklin's side in this. Um, I personally, I don't even think he had to explain himself. I mean. Uh, social media is going to do what it wants in this right. day and age. I mean, yep. you're never going to please everyone, right. especially especially there. I didn't think he was running up the score. Um, I thought more than anything, what happened in the opener was in, was was really testament to just how deep this Penn State team is. Um, one of the things that struck me most about this game, Greg, and you've seen Penn State play a while, a long time. Other than like their best players, Etor Gross Matos, you know, Micah Parsons, yep. Cam Brown didn't even play. Right. Donovan Johnson didn't play. Other uh, Pat Frymuth. Other than their top players, if you took the numbers off the jerseys, you would have a hard time telling the first team from the second team from almost even the third team. You look at mm -hmm. the running back room, you know, when the fourth team tailback is going 81 yards for a touchdown and making it look easy, this is clearly an indication of just how deep they are. Right. 
And it bodes well for when they get in games against tougher teams in the fourth quarter. I think they're in position now to hold some leads if, if they kind of can get there. Yeah, and I think one thing we can wrap up on is that how many times do we see James Franklin refuse to take Trace McSorley out of the yeah. game because it was in it wasn't in hand yet it wasn't comfortable enough? Right. I mean, just to even just to follow up on your point, and maybe they did this because the second, the first, and the second, the second and third are closer than they've ever been mm-hmm. in his time at Penn State. But you know, he pulled uh, the first team guys fairly quickly yeah. compared to what he's done in the past. So. You know, I think that's another part of that conversation. But, I mean, they did not waste the opportunity to get a lot of guys in. And they did not, um, you know, it's not, again, it's like you said, it's like they were out there doing fancy things or running trick plays or, you know, flea flickers and stuff like yeah. that. It was a normal offense. There were five guys that had a chance to stop Nick Urie. Yeah, yes, zone, yes. None of them could. That's just the way football, you know. Just the way it goes. Okay, let's move on to the freshmen. It, it almost the number almost got so high it was hard to keep track of them. He played so many of them. Right. He talked about the green lights before uh, the opener. Guys that they were they wanted to play more than four games and they weren't really worried about redshirting them. I think unofficially the count was ten or eleven by the time they were done. Mm-hmm. You know, Devin Ford, Noah Kane, Brandon Smith, Lance Dixon, Caden Wallace, Adisa Isaac, Keaton Ellis. Uh, I'm sure uh, I'm missing a couple there, but it was it was double digits, a true freshman. Right. Uh, you know, some of them are probably are going to redshirt. Mm-hmm. But what do you think uh, the, the opener showed you as far as the, them playing well and maybe earning the right to play the rest of the season? Yeah, the one that strikes me most is uh, Caden Wallace. You know, we knew the two running backs were going to play pretty much as much as it need, as, as yeah. much as is needed to get through a game. Um, you knew Keaton Ellis was going to play a lot. You know, it seems like even with Donovan Johnson suspended for week one, it just feels like there's a role full time for Joey Porter Jr. Uh, I don't know about Marquise Wilson. We'll see about special teams. Mm -hmm. You know, Lance Dix and Brandon Smith were guys that just from a physical uh, readiness standpoint, they should have been on that list of guys to play like a Jesse Lucchetta did last year, maybe all 13 games on special teams. But they're really pushing Caden Wallace hard almost to the point where I don't think, you know, you could see him, I think, earn a, a spot on that special teams blocking unit for field goals and extra points, maybe punts. I mean, they really like him. That surprised me a little bit. But, Bob, the question, I was going to say this for the mailbag, then we had some good ones come in, so we can move it up here. Um, is there a point to redshirt guys that are physically ready anymore? I mean, how many of these guys at the level Penn State's recruiting are going to stay for five years anyway? Yeah, that's the question is if they're physically ready now. Uh, Brenton Strange played and caught a touchdown. Mm-hmm. I they're they're pretty deep at tight end. He's he's a, he's an impressive looking kid. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's all the way physically ready. Uh, much like Zach Coons right. probably wasn't ready last year. But most of those kids, it's such an impressive class physically. They look like they are uh, ready to go. Salim Worley also played. Yeah. Um, but. The positions where they play them at, running back and defensive back, James Franklin talks about the fact that those guys are usually sure. the most game ready to play mm-hmm. in college right away. And they have a lot of good players at those positions. Um, out of all the kids that I saw play, obviously Devin Ford with the 81 yard touchdown. And I think Noah Kane, because he can do some things inside. Yeah. Um, Brandon Smith is a guy that. As deep as they are at linebacker, especially with Cam Brown back, you saw that hit he had in the game against the uh, in the second half against the one kid from Idaho, yep. and it kind of got the sideline excited. I just only I, th- I think as he starts to play faster, it's going to be impossible for him not to be maybe a top six linebacker. He's mm-hmm. just he's just too good. They put Lance Dixon on the kickoff team, right? So that's a clear indication that there's no there's no thought really of redshirting no. him. I think you're right. They're going to play him. They're going to get him ready to play. And I think the thinking is. You know, after three years, some of these kids might be wanting to leave early. They're that good. Yeah, three after three years, some of them might want to leave early. After four years, almost all of them are going to want to go to the draft. There's yeah. not there's Jan Johnson's the exception to the rule of a guy that comes back for his fifth year. Um, there's just and some of the guys once they get to that fifth year, they're just going to say, "I don't want to get beat up anymore." Yeah. You know, I'm tired of of this. So uh, if they're ready to go, even if it's for a couple, of, I know the old sort of rule was if you're only going to play a guy a couple of plays a right. game don't burn his red yeah. shirt um and now they have now that they have four games this is a little bit easier to do but the way i see it if a guy can help you one play a game just use him as yeah. many times as many games as you think can help you win because again a lot of these kids the ones they're recruiting that are as talented as some of the ones we've talked about they're not five-year college yeah. football players anyway anymore and I, and I know they're young but um if you don't play them 
uh, when it's time to play them in games like this. Now they have the NCAA transfer portal. Right. That, I mean, they, you just know what you don't know what a kid wants to do. Right. I mean, that's probably an extreme case, but you want to give them reasons to stay if they've earned the right to play and they're physically ready to play and they can help the team. Mm -hmm. I think that is going to be the way I was originally thinking at the start of the year. They were going to try and manage that. And James said we were going to hold some kids back in case there were injuries. But a kid like Caden Wallace, yeah. um, he referenced the fact that uh, um, Will Fries dealt with an injury halfway you know halfway through last year Ryan Bates has played hurt they just haven't had enough depth at tackle so I think that's kind of why right. they're they're going to fast track him Des Holmes played a lot but if you're going to play offensive line you're going to play hurt probably the second half of the season because of the the nature of the game I mm -hmm. think they want they want they want a full top four at tackle and I think right. Caden Wallace is going to even if he doesn't play a lot early in the season they want him ready to go um, if, if the te if the season's going to go the way want it, they want it to, they want him available if they're going to be in some big games late. Yeah, no, no doubt. All right, the quarterback, Sean Clifford. Mm -hmm. He got one post game question with a reference made to Trace McSorley. Yeah, I don't know if you remember who asked it, but I do. It was Dave Jones. I think it was yeah, Penn Live. Yeah, right, correct. And it was actually funny. It was a funny moment. It was caught on video, and Dave had a nice exchange with him. But uh, Sean Clifford ended up. If you look at his final numbers, Greg, 280 yards, uh, two touchdowns to K.J. Hamler, ran the ball. Um, it's hard to determine uh, how effective he really was against this defense, but he looked and threw the ball, I thought, on time. He was pretty accurate. But as they scored 79 points, and their, fir their first two drives didn't necessarily go the way they wanted to. I think they ended in a pair of field goals, one right. a long one, 53 yards by Jordan Stout. Uh, do you, I mean, it's his first game. I think, I think you got to give him a mulligan for being a little bit nervous. How do you think he's going to start, uh, against Buffalo on Saturday night? Yeah. I mean, the question just becomes now, so he's experienced his first game as a starting quarterback. Now he has to experience his first primetime game as a starting quarterback. And does that get things juiced up a little bit more yeah. than what we've seen in the past? And I'm not even sure. And so, and what I'll be interested to watch mostly Bob is, there were times with Trace McSorley at this offense started slow. Oh, yeah. And the question I will be interested to watch is, does that contain, like, is that just something that's going to be a hallmark of maybe the Ricky Ronnie era at Penn State where the offense just comes out of the gate slow? I don't know. Um, and that, But I think it's fascinating to watch because you've seen the games where they get jump out and go right down the field and score. I don't have it in front of me, but I'd be willing to bet they'd win 85% of those games. Um, the ones where they kind of mess around for a quarter and maybe don't get going until a little before halftime are the ones they tend to struggle in. So, um, again, it's not a case every time. But, yeah, I, you would have to think he'll be in a much better place to start this week. And some of his teammates will, too. Keep in mind, he had a lot of first-time starters at other positions as well in front of him. Yeah, Trace McSorley. I remember, I think his first game might have been his start. It was against Kent State. And if you look at that score, um, it was actually a fairly close game. And there was a defensive touchdown by Penn State that kind of salted that one away. Uh, a four-year time, Michael Robinson, the quarterback of the mm -hmm. 2005 team, was a veteran. His first couple of starts that year were a little uneven. I just think it goes with, you know, the adrenaline and, and the crowd and mm -hmm. all of that. It's easy to get pretty excited. You, the atmosphere is is really almost second to none in college football. I think right. that had a lot to do with it. I would expect he'll it'll be a cleaner game. And he, it wasn't like it wasn't he was messy. He was just right. a little bit high on a couple of throws. Mm -hmm. And I think he's a kid that's got a lot of poise. And I think that I'm going to say I'm going to say this was this was uh, the exception to the rule. I'd be surprised if he goes a quarter against Buffalo and he's running off the field after a three and out. I just they're too talented. They mm -hmm. can do too many things in the running game. Yep. So I think you're going to see him make a big step. I think forward off of that uh, off of that performance. So that's I think we're about three quarters into this. I was going to say it's mailbag so, time. So you already burned a mailbag question on me. It was, was worthwhile. A, a little. I'm still waiting for. Uh, at, at some point, we're going to talk about I think picks and predictions. So I'm, I'm waiting to mm -hmm. give you some guff about one of your picks. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yes. Uh, what do you have for me from the mailbag? Okay. First off, after seeing what we saw week one. With the quarterbacks, we'll just use that as a segue. Do you think the competition between Sean Clifford and Will Levis was as close as maybe James Franklin made it out to be? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I think that you, you're never going to say it was an easy call. Right. You're never going to say. But we saw snippets of them in practice. We mm -hmm. saw the spring game. We saw we saw those guys go to work, uh, you know, in the opener. I never got the sense that it was you know, 51, 49 in terms of a vote. I mm -hmm. thought that, I, and I think that's why James was never in a really big hurry 
to really announce it. I think he knew all along it was going to be Sean. Mm -hmm. I think they like Will. Will's going to have to learn to slide when he runs uh, the football. Yeah, that, James, that's clear. James yeah. <laughs> made a, a point of that. Stop trying to take on the world and show everyone that you've been in the weight room for the last two years. But um, they like him a lot. But James is always on record as he's a one quarterback guy. There's really no room for, for two. So, um, you know, assuming everyone stays healthy and Sean progresses next year, you know, James was going to couch it the way he's going to couch it and say, look, it's going to be a competition. But I never really got a sense watching them and watching how they carried themselves uh, that that Will was really threatening Sean for the job. I don't know. What, do, you, do you kind of see no, the same we're way? on the same page there? Yeah. I mean, it just felt like Clifford had a little bit more certainty about himself during the snippets that we saw in practice. It just felt like he was the one that took a leadership role from the time Tommy Stevens yeah. left until the time he was named the starting quarterback. And he just. He just had that it factor. And I think Will Levis will eventually have it, but I don't think he's quite there yet. James Franklin said that hit Clifford being a year older played a big role in the decision. And there's a lot of things that come with that, I think, that helped to get him to that point. Yeah, he played last year. He did, every right. time he played last year, he did some good things. So you can kind of see it coming. Hopefully Will can, can gain on him. But uh, the way that Sean started, I think he might be tough to catch. And there's two true freshman quarterbacks behind Will that at some point, they're going to get their feet. So mm -hmm. They're going to settle in a little bit. And I think that he, he might have a challenge holding off that. Yeah, no doubt. All right. Question two. John Reed had the first interception for Penn State in 2019. Will he ultimately lead the Lions in interceptions this fall? I mean, he's going to be he's going to be a tough one, I think, to beat out. I think the safeties might get involved mm -hmm. in this little competition. Uh, I still think Keaton Ellis is going to get a couple. But the, one of the reasons I think that John Reed is going to be mm -hmm. a tough guy to beat out is I don't think he's going to come off the field a lot. When they go right. to the 4 2 five, he's the guy that slides. He's the first guy I think they move into the into the nickel slot uh, position. So I don't I think he'll be on the field enough where and he's smart enough that I would say it's his it's it's his crown to lose. But if there's one or two guys that maybe might get two or three this year, I think one will be Keaton Ellis. And I think. Of the safeties, I, th I think Garrett Taylor would be a guy I'd look for as well. Yeah, I, I, easy. I mean, I could see – really, the only corner I could see challenging John Reed would be Castro Fields. I probably should have mentioned him. Too. Yeah, I probably not wise. Well, that's okay. I mean, he won't – he shouldn't come off the field a whole lot either. Right, so, he'll be right. in – Keaton Ellis was the takeaway king in spring practice, so maybe that will play a role. Who knows? We'll see. I don't know if he'll be on the field enough, but – Okay, last mailbag question for you. Now that you've seen, and we talked about a little bit before, the running back rotation in action for one week. Uh, I know where you're going with this. Go ahead. Yeah. We're, so the pecking order began, Devin, for, or I'm sorry, Ricky Slade, Journey Brown, and then Noah Kane or Devin Ford. And the depth charts still list ors, so it's yeah. not really going to do us any good. Um, which back will end up having the most carries this week, taking into yeah. account the potential for a blowout, the potential for backups to play a lot. Who leads the lines and carries this it week? It sure looks like they're going to give – Slade two series, then they're going to go to Journey Brown for two. Then mm -hmm. Noah's going to get one. And depending on how the game, that's five possessions. Depending right. on how where they are after five, they'll make a determination on Devin Ford. And they'll, they'll make a decision on who of the first three played the best. I actually thought Devin, you know, Devin Ford had over 100 yards. He only had six carries. 80 came on one play. Mm -hmm. He got a great block from Justin Shorter to kind of seal the deal. I thought of all four of them. I actually thought Journey Brown was the most impressive. Um, and he looks so much physically different than he did, I think, when he was actually a true freshman. Yeah. He's he's definitely he definitely he, he looks quick too. He is he plays to his track speed. In other right. words, he does he's not tentative at all. I was encouraged that all of them were used in the passing game. Um, this is this is an enviable position I think that Ricky Ronnie uh, finds himself in with these guys. And when James Franklin says, you know, in the in the fourth quarter of a close game, we're going to go with the hot hand. I believe him. I don't think I think this could literally be a week to week decision, depending on how they all. Some of them, it's not always going to be the same. Some of them do better when they get more carries. Some of them don't need a lot of reps. The one thing I would say, though, Greg, is I think that uh, as the season plays out in goal line situations, I kind of would look for Noah Kane maybe yeah. when it's third and one, third and two. He just looks like he he got he has a little bit more oomph and he always falls forward. We'll see if he becomes kind of that short yardage back. But, man, um, I don't ever recall 
uh, a depth chart quite like this at running back for Penn State. He, he's really loaded at that position, and they got more guys coming. They sure do. All right. Well, I forgot to send you the text to close us out of here, so I'm going to have to do it for us. But uh, if you listen to the podcast after this break, we're going to get into our picks and predictions for Buffalo Week. Remember to like, subscribe, rate. It is on Apple, Stitcher, Google, wherever else you get your favorite podcast. If you're listening to the watching the video, uh, you're going to have to go to the next video on YouTube.com slash All Penn State, where it's picks and predictions time. And maybe we'll even get into some Big Ten questions. 